Thursday, so put that on your mind so we're not having church on Christmas Day and we'll spend time with your family and do all that good stuff. We will have a New Year's Eve service, amen, obviously on New Year's Eve, December the 31st, and we'll let you know the time with that later on to come. Amen. First Corinthians chapter number 9, beginning at verse number 24. Familiar passage of scripture, know ye not that they which run in the race run all, but only one receiveth the prize. So run that ye may obtain. And every man that striveth for the mint mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. I therefore so run, not as uncertainty, so fight I, not as one that beateth the air. But I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest by any means when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. Amen. Just for a little bit here tonight, I want to talk about the prize. Amen. I want to talk about the prize. When I was in uh, sports, back when I was fit and athletic, you know, I, I loved playing games. I loved playing. I played on the basketball team, was on the football team. I ran track in elementary school, but I couldn't just wrap my mind around just running for running's sake. And so running just to be first, that's to me worthless. You know, if you want to run and get a ball over a line, you want to run to get a ball in a hoop, I'm, I'm with you. You want to run to catch a ball like baseball or something, I, I can do that. But just running to run, plus probably didn't affect me much because I wasn't that fast, so I always got beat, so I, that probably why I didn't like track very much. But I like playing games, and I like to know what I'm playing for. So I don't like to play a game just to play. I guess not in my old age I do, but when I play a game, as they always say, I play to win. You know, I want to be number one. I want to come in first. But when we were in school or when I played in a church league basketball, I, you know, you have to sign up and you go through practices. And you go through conditioning. You go through shoot-arounds. I had to go to early morning basketball practices, basketball practices at 6 a.m. on Christmas break just because they wanted us there. We had to practice late evenings. We did the stretching. The, I went through the hurting, went through the pain. I didn't want to go through all of that for nothing. I didn't want to go through the practices and the death valleys and, and all those full court layup drills. I didn't want to go through all of that for nothing. But I knew, at least in basketball, that if I did this, that there was something on the other side. That if I did this, it was to try to be number one. There was a trophy at the end of it, by county champs, citywide champs, you know, now when you get to high school, champs, state champs, and, you know, eventually if you were in college, NCAA champs, and NBA, but they say world champions, but it's not the world. They're only playing in America. It's the United States championship, but that's a whole other topic for another day. But they, they play for a prize, and so that's why they go through the hurt, that's why they go through the pain, that's why they go through the dieting, that's why they go through the hours of exercise, that's why they go through spending time away from their family. It's to obtain something, to be number one, to win the trophy, or something of that nature. But the same thing is true in the spirit. That I want you to know, we're going to remind you tonight about what we are playing for. This, there's a reason why that we do all the praying that we do, all the reading that we do, the fasting, why we give, why we serve each other, why we love one another, why we worship, why we praise, why we cry, why we weep, witnessing, teaching, preaching. We, there's a purpose for all of this. It's not just something that we decide to do just to pass the time, but there is something that we are striving for. It's more than that. We are striving for a prize. And I think sometimes we forget that there is a prize. I think sometimes that we get caught going through the motions. We get caught on negative things. And But if we can keep our eyes on the prize, that's what a good coach does. They always tell us, if you do this, there's something that you're going to obtain. You're going to be number one. You're going to hoist that trophy. You're going to get paid millions of dollars, you know, whatever they try to bribe you with. But they try to keep your eyes on the prize. And so that's what we're going to do today is remind us of the prize of what we are playing, what we are running this race for. Because at the end of this, there is a prize that is to be won. Amen. I want to hear Jesus say this in Matthew 25, 21. He said unto him, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things, but I will make you rule over many things. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. Jesus refers to the prize as the joy of the Lord here in this text. I'm going to get to that in just a little bit. In another text, he refers to it as his rest. And to me, to my rest. And so this is what we are ultimately striving for. This is the prize that we are going to obtain. And I'm going to get into that a little bit more in depth in just a moment. But let's turn to Revelation chapter number 21. This is where we're going to spend most of our time here tonight. Amen. I want to talk about the prize. Revelation 21, beginning at 
at verse number one. The Bible says, I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. Verse number four, And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying. Neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, these words are true and faithful. John is writing Revelation 21 after in his description. This takes place after the devil has been loosed for a thousand years to wreak havoc on the earth one more time. Once the thousand years is up, the Bible says that there is a great white throne of judgment. And that everyone, the Bible goes in to describe the dead, the small, the great, we which are alive, are going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And we are going to be judged by the books. And after the judgment, the Bible says that death and hell are cast into the lake of fire, which it refers to as the second death. Once all of that is finished, and the end of the time has come to its, the time has come to its end, then John begins to write. Now, there's only 22 chapters in the book of Revelation, so the second to last chapter, he begins to talk about the prize of what we had been striving for this whole time, and what we fought so hard to obtain. He begins by telling us that this new Jerusalem is a holy city, and that it is a bride like a bride prepared for her husband. It is, in other words, it is perfection. He goes on to pen that God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. How many people are excited about that? He begins to say that there is no more death, no more sorrow, no more crying, and no more pain. How many people are excited about that? Amen. And that's what we're running this race for. That's why we come to church. That's why we worship. That's why we give. That's why we witness. That's why we serve. That's why we look different, why we act different, why we talk different. All oh, we do all this because there is a prize at the end of this thing. And like the old song says, it will be worth it all when we see Jesus. Amen. I want to make heaven my home. There's a lot of reasons why people decide to go for the prize. They do it for themselves. They just want to get salvation. Other people, they just want to get everybody there. I, I want to get to heaven. I want to bring as many people with me as possible because that's why we're here. Amen. I want Jesus to say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter ye into the joy of thy Lord. Enter ye into my rest. I don't want to live life and just go through the motions and then at the end of it, he says, depart from me, you worker of iniquity. I don't know you. But while I'm doing this, just like in basketball practice, we had to practice like it was the game. We had to give our energy, our effort, everything that we did. We had to pay attention to detail because when we got into the game, that was what got us the victory. And by getting more victories, it got us closer to the prize at the end. And that's why when we come to church, we hear a lot about prayer. We hear a lot about fasting. We hear a lot about worship and praise and, and being a witness and telling everybody about Jesus Christ because... If we can put all of those things together, we'll have an overcoming life and it will be worth it all. We will hear Jesus say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. And so skip down to verse number 9 of Revelation 21. The Bible says, there came unto me one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials full of the seven last plagues, talked with me, saying, come hither, and I will show thee the bride, the Lamb's wife. He carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain. And showed me the great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God, and her light was like the stone most precious, even like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. And had a wall great and high, twelve gates, and the gates were twelve angels. The names written thereon are the names of the twelve tribes of the children of Israel. On the east, three gates. On the north, three gates. On the south, three gates. And on the west, three gates. The wall of the city had twelve foundations, and in them the names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. This prize that we are going to obtain is no need for the Son, because the Bible says in Revelation 7 that the Lamb is the light thereof. The light 
is so pure that it's clear. The wall around is great and high, having 12 gates. The Bible says there's three on the north, the south, the east, and the west. The gates have the names of the 12 tribes of Israel. Then you begin to think, why would God put the 12 tribes of Israel there? Well, they are God's chosen people. The whole Old Testament was written for the 12 tribes of Israel, talking about their journey from slavery. God would tell them over and over again that you are my people. And so he has the 12 tribes of Israel there. On the wall, it says there's 12 foundations, which are the names of the 12 apostles. Think about this. What an honor it is for the apostles to have their name as part of the foundations of the New Jerusalem. Peter, John, James, Andrew, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, James, the son of Alphaeus, Simon, the Zealots, Judas, the brother of James, Thomas, and what I would consider the Apostle Paul, because Judas, we know, goes and hangs himself and, and does all that stuff. But Paul refers to himself as an apostle, so I put Paul in there, and I might be wrong on that, but that's all right. Why are they listed? Why are the disciples and the apostles listed at the 12 foundations of this new Jerusalem? Because when you think about the apostles and you think about the disciples, they were the foundation of the church. It was the apostles that brought us the gospel message, Acts chapter 2. They toiled and they labored to build us the foundation that we have. Ephesians 2 and 20, the Bible talks about that we're a spiritual house. And it says in verse 20, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. And I love that the Bible then is so awesome how it all fits together. Because we are built upon the foundation of the apostles, they are the foundations of the wall of the city. Jesus said that if any man climbs up any other way, tries to get into the city or tries to climb up another way, the same as a thief or a robber. So if we want to make it into heaven, if we want to make it to the prize, the first thing that we must do is we better follow the apostles' doctrine. We better follow what the apostles did, what they preached, and how they lived. And I'll tell you what they preached. They preached repentance. They preached baptism in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of our sins. And they preached receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost, speaking in other tongues as the Spirit of God gave the utterance. And they talked about living a holy and a godly life. They talked about being a people of praise and a people that worship. They talked about being separated, being a chosen generation, being a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people that we should show forth the praises of him who have called us out of darkness and into his marvelous light. And so, if we are going to get into the wall of the prize, the first thing we better do is study what the apostles preached, what they believed, what they taught, how were they baptized, how did they live their life, what did they do, what was their faith like, what kind of miracles were done, amen, because the whole thing is built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. And so, then we skip down to Revelation 21, 15 to 16. The Bible says, and he that talked with me had a golden reed to measure the city, the gates thereof and the wall thereof. And the city lieth four square, the length of it is as large as the breadth, measured the city with a reed, 12,000 furlongs, the length and the breadth and the height of it are equal. So when you break this down, the Bible says the city lieth four square. It means that it's a square, there's equal sides. It has four corners. And the reason the square, because it says the length and the breadth are equal. And the Bible says the length is as large as the breadth, which is as large as its height. So it's like a big cube, if you want to look at it that way. But yeah, then you go back to our text. So I always wonder, why, why does Paul in 1 Corinthians 9 refer to this as a race? I'm going to get back to this thing in a second. Why would Paul liken us to a race? In our initial text, he said, you're living here as a race, only one receives a prize. Some would say it refers to a race because it takes endurance. And they use the scripture, he that endureth to the end, the same shall be saved. And I believe that that's very adamant, very accurate. Some people would say it refers to the race because it's not really how you start, but it's how you finish. And I, I can get that too, because some of us didn't start out in church, but thank God that the blood found us and somebody told us about God. And so now we're running the race right now. And so if, if people preach it that way, then I'm okay with that too, because I'm 100% behind all that. I didn't grow up in, in Pentecost. I didn't 
grow up being apostolic. So I thank God that, amen, it's not how you start, but I thank God that it's not how you finish. Amen. But all those things are great. But one reason that I believe he likens our lives here to a race is because when John describes the heavenly Jerusalem, he says that it measures it with a reed and it comes out to be 12,000 furlongs. A furlong, the word furlong comes from the word stadium. Stadium, which we get the word stadium from. So he says a furlong is sta a stadium. And it sounds like stadium. And so if you look at the definition in the Greek, it means a stadium or a race course. So when you look at it, that's why I believe he likens it to a race because he says that, that the heavenly Jerusalem basically is like a stadium. It's like a race. Hebrews 12 and 1. Wherefore, seeing we also are passed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin that would so easily beset us and let us run with patience, what? The race that is set before us. If it's defined as a stadium, then that verse then makes sense with what Paul is saying. Because when you are in a stadium, you are in a great cloud of witnesses. If you've ever played in a stadium or if you've been to a stadium, the event is in the center and everybody else is in the stadium seating. They surround them as like a great cloud of witnesses. And so what Paul is saying and then what John is relaying is the fact that maybe it is kind of like a stadium. That you get in, the angels are there and they're watching kind of like the main event, and they're watching you, and they're cheering you on, amen, as they're in this, this heavenly Jerusalem. And so, a furlong, if you break it down, a furlong is 600 feet. If you do the math, it says it's 12,000 furlongs. 12,000 times 600 is 7,200,000 feet. So to put that in perspective, it's how, it's how long, how wide, and how tall the new Jerusalem is. Put in perspective, one mile is how many feet? Anybody know? 5,280. 5,280 feet. So if you take the 7.2 million divided by the 5,280, the New Jerusalem is approximately 1,370 miles. About 1,370 miles wide, long, and tall. So in order to grasp that concept, if you map quest from right here to Miami, Florida, it's 1,370 miles. So basically, the New Jerusalem is from here to Miami, Florida, length, width, length, and height of this thing. And if you take it by the cube that it is, 1,363 miles by 1,363 by 1,363, you multiply that out, it is 2,532,000,000. 139,147 cube miles. So this heavenly Jerusalem is over two and a half billion cube miles. That is a long, that is a lot of area. In fact, to put that into perspective, I was doing some research, it would be like us traveling from the earth to the sun 27.2 times. That's how big that New Jerusalem is. It's like going from here to the sun 27.24 times. That is one big old heavenly Jerusalem. Amen. And I just want to get me a mansion in there somewhere. Amen. Or get me a shack in there somewhere. Just get me into the heavenly Jerusalem. That's where I want to be. Amen. So this thing is a big place. This is what we're striving for. This is part of the prize. Verse number 17 of Revelation 21. The Bible says he measured the wall thereof 144 cubits according to the measure of a man, that is, of the angel. A cubit is 18 inches. So if the wall is 144 cubits, it's 2,592 feet. So the wall is almost a half a mile high. And then you begin to think, why then does heaven have a wall? Why does New Jerusalem have a wall around it? Because not everyone that shall say, Lord, Lord, shall enter into his rest. Matthew 7, 21, Jesus said, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. So he puts this wall around it, because not everyone is going to make it. It's his will that not any should perish, right? It's his will that not any should perish, but God gives us this thing called free will. He gives us the ability and the capability to make our own decisions. And so every day we decide whether or not we want to pray. We 
we decide whether or not we want to worship, whether we want to study, whether we want to communicate with God or have a relationship with God. And so he wants us to make the right choice. That's why there's three gates on one side, three on the north, south, east, and the west. There's 12 gates. There's enough room for everybody to get in there. He can open the gates and boom, we can get on in there. It's not his will that any should perish. But just like God, he's got boundaries. There are some things that we just have to do. So the people that say, I can live how I want to, do what I want to, be baptized how I want to, the Holy Ghost isn't really that important. I, I just want people to understand that there are boundaries to this thing. There are walls around this thing. And it's not open for the thieves and the robbers just to climb up and change the gospel to what fits their ideas and what fits their lifestyle. Amen. The, the, we are not to change the Bible to fit our lifestyle, but our lifestyle is supposed to be changed by the Bible. That's why he wrote this thing called the Holy Bible. It was so we have a template and a blueprint of how we can get from here to make heaven our home. I want to get from here to when either I die or the trumpet sounds or whatever and I stand before the judgment seat of Christ and he says, the Bible says he's going to take out the books. He's going to take out the book right here, the Bible. He's going to take out this book. Amen. And so as he's looking at this thing, he's going to judge me by what the book says. And I want to line my life up by what this book says. This is what's going to get me to heaven. This is the book. This is the game plan. This is what we need to do if we are going to get there. And so he doesn't want thieves and he doesn't want robbers and he doesn't want people that change his gospel or change what his want, his commandments. He doesn't want any of that. He wants us to abide by what he has in the word of God. And so that's why there is a wall around it. Amen. It's there for our protection. It is there also to keep some people out. Revelation 21, 18, the building of the wall of it was jasper. The city was pure gold, like unto clear glass. The gold is so pure that it becomes clear. Now they say when you study how the refining process of gold, that it actually can get to the point that it can be clear. But it takes a lot of refining, a lot of heat, a lot of straining, a lot of back in the fire, a lot of pounding, a lot of getting up the imperfections. And it's a long and it's a very hot and a very tedious process. But and if you know anything about gold, the more impurities are taken out of it, the more costly it is. The purer the gold, the more value that it holds. And so when you look at this new Jerusalem, that the prize that we're trying to obtain... This gold is so pure that this thing is clear. You can see right through this thing. It's the most valuable thing. And just think, we're going to just be walking on it. That's God's pavement. God's pavement is just pure gold. Amen. We, we, we struggle to get a dollar. Amen. We go through our car seats to get 25 cents and 10 cents and trying to get some money for the pop machine and the vending machine. Amen. But God owns so much and, and he, he's got, he owns the cattle on a thousand hill. He says, everything in heaven, you look at it, walls of jasper, gates of pearl, and streets of gold. Gold that is so fine and so valuable that that thing is clear. Amen. I want to go. I want to see that. I want to see streets of gold. I, you know, when I thought of uh, heavenly Jerusalem, I think of like the yellow brick road in, in Wizard of Oz. You know, because gold we think of is yellow, and so at least I do. And so we, you know, I would think of, hey, it's kind of like walking down the yellow brick road. But man, this thing is so pure and so uh, clean that it is it is clear. In fact, in verse 21, the Bible says that John describes it as the streets of the city are pure gold, as it were transparent glass. Transparent, meaning you can see right through that thing. Amen. It's transparent glass. So I want to go and I want to see this wall of jasper. I want to see this pure gold. I want to see what heavenly Jerusalem is all about. Verse number 19, the Bible says, The foundations of the wall of the city were garnished with all manner of precious stones. The first foundation was jasper, the second sapphire, the third chalcedony, the fourth an emerald, the fifth sardonyx, the sixth sardines, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth uh, chrysoprase, press, whatever, the eleventh jason, and the twelfth the amethyst. And twelve gates were twelve pearls, and every several gate was one pearl, and the street of the city was pure gold, as it were transparent glass. And so when you break down the foundations, Jasper, they liken it to a diamond. Sapphire is a brilliant blue stone. Chalcedony is a sky blue stone with colored stripes. It can be done that way. An emerald, everybody knows what the emerald looks like, bright green, nice green colored stone. 
A sardonyx is right or red and white striped stone. The sardius is various shades of red. The chrysolite is transparent gold or yellow. The barrel is shades of green, yellow, and blue. Topaz, yellowish green. The chrysoprasus is gold tinted green. The jason is blue or violet color, and the amethyst is a purple stone. And you look at these stones that are there. These brightly colored stones will refract the shining brilliance of God's glory into the spectrum that is going to be so beautiful that colors are going to flash everywhere. When you think about this, when I was a kid, my mom had this, uh, just like it was a crystal, that she would hang in the rearview mirror. And then as she was driving, you would see rainbows everywhere. Anybody ever have one of those? You, you know, you, you put a crystal up, if the light shines through it, it breaks it apart, and you can see the rainbow everywhere. And it was cool. All over the place, you would just see rainbows. Now, the Bible says that we're not going to get any need for the sun because the Lamb is the light thereof. We know that He is the light of the world, right? So when you take the purest light that there could be, and you begin to shine that light through these 12 foundations and the, the jasper and the ground and all of these different stones, when you begin to shine the light through that, the, the light that comes off the other side, the beautiful colors that we are going to experience in heavenly Jerusalem, our, my mind can't even fathom the beauty that is going to come. I look at just light going through a, a, a crystal and watching the rainbows and thinking, man, that is just awesome how that happens, how the light comes through, refracts it, and all of a sudden there's the rainbow. But you put all 12 of these foundations with the purest light from that there ever could possibly be, the light of God, and as it shines through the foundations, I mean, you talk about like Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory, you know, they walk through there in all these beautiful colors, and the, the first time the Wizard of Oz, you know, was the first movie in color, everybody was like, man, this is so beautiful. I tell you what, the, the beauty that we are going to see in heaven is going to be unlike something that you could even imagine. No words are going to be able to describe the beauty that is what we would call the New Jerusalem. I and mean, then just seeing pure light, going through pure foundations, going through pure streets of gold, going through pure jasper and pearl and topaz and crystal praxis and Jason and Anderson. It is going to be so beauty. Revelation 21, 23, the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God did light it. And the Lamb is the light thereof. Hey, Amen. That's why I want to go there. I want to see the light just shine through it. Revelation 21, 25, the gates of it shall not be shut at all by day, for there shall be no night there. And this is why I believe that Jesus told the man with the talents to enter into the joy of thy Lord. Now, we think, and normally when I hear this verse quoted, we say, enter into the joy of the Lord. That's not what the verse says. It says, enter into the joy of thy Lord. Because when you go there, understand that weeping, we usually... Go with the nighttime. Hence Psalms 34. Weeping endureth for a night, but joy comes in the morning. Why could Jesus tell the man with the talents, enter to the joy of thy Lord? Because he was going into a place where there would be no night. There would be no weeping. And so it is constantly a morning setting. So there is always joy in the presence of God. That's why the Bible says in the presence of God there is fullness of joy at his right hand there are pleasures forevermore so because there is no night in heaven there is going to be no weeping it's always morning and it is a place of eternal joy don't you want to get to a place of eternal joy when you wake up and you're just happy and you just go and of course there is no daytime there's no time amen there's just eternity with god and so as as we would consider time passing we're still smiling we're still happy we're still sitting before the throne of god saying holy 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 lord god almighty which was and is and is to come and the thing about heaven is going to be this like a new toy or a new gadget what happens is once you have it for a while it becomes old it becomes Monotonous, it becomes boring until you get something else. I buy a video game, or when I used to, and I play it, then I beat it, and it gets boring. So you don't play it anymore. The thing about heaven, it's never going to get boring. Amen. You can never, ever, ever be bored standing in the presence of God, watching the light, watching.
the colors and seeing the angels worshiping and seeing the 420 elders worshiping and seeing the beast worship and seeing everything that goes on in heaven. We're not going to have time to worry, no time to stress out because the light of God is there and where the light of God is, there is joy and there's no weeping and there is no sadness and there is no death. I want to be in that place. That's why I pray. That's why I fast. That's why I do what I do. Because I understand that on the other side, amen, I'll understand it better by and by. I'll understand it is worth it when I get to heaven. I just want to get to heaven. I want to get to a place where it's just constant daytime. Amen. Always the perfect temperature. No more polar vortex. Amen. No more high humidities. None of that. It's going to be the perfect temperature. And then hanging out with the one and only true God and hanging out with your brothers and sisters in Christ. Isn't it just going to be a time? We sing that song, won't we have a time when we get over yonder? Amen. And I believe we're going to have a time. I believe we have, we sit in heavenly places right now. We have a good time here. But if you think our praise breaks here are good, amen, just wait till we get to the other side. Just wait till we get and we see him. And then with his nail pierced hand,
make our calling and election sure. Amen. If there's even a doubt for a moment in your eyes today, in your mind today, that if the Lord came back right now that you are not ready to go to heaven, I'm asking you today, would you just make a change for God? Because this is what we're striving for. We, we talk a lot about hell and, you know, not really, I don't talk enough about it, maybe, but, you know, hell is this bottomless pit. It burns forever and ever. I don't want to focus on that right now, but I'm telling you, heaven is very real, but so is hell. And if you don't think for a moment, if you don't feel like that, if the Lord came back right now, that you would go to heaven. Amen. I, we need to make a change in our lives today. Amen. I want to search myself. I want to have the God search my heart, as David said. Try my heart and see if there be any wickedness in me. If there is, God, take it out of me. Because I want to make it to heaven. I want to get that prize. I want to see it come down from heaven as a bride adorned for her husband. And when that thing comes down, it's like when we won, when I was in seventh grade basketball, we won the bike hockey championship. And when they brought that trophy out, man, it's just cool when you see that thing coming across the stage and you know you get to hold it. And you know that you fought a good fight. You know that you played your best and you are the champion. Amen. I just can't imagine the joy that I'm going to feel. And then when we see New Jerusalem come down from heaven and I can see that same man, I can't wait. I can't wait till I get up in there. I can't wait till I get my mansion. I can't wait till I get to see Jesus. I can't wait till I get to hang out with Peter and Paul and some of the great pillars of the Old Testament and the New Testament. I can't wait to get to hang out with some of my heroes of faith that have gone on before. People that we read about in the history books, but also heroes from our church like Pastor E. Bright and some of these other ones. Man, I want to get to heaven and I want to tell them, you know what? Thank you for teaching me. Thank you for preaching to me. Amen. Because I'm here because of you. And I want to go hang out with them. I want to spend eternity with people like that. I want to sit before the throne of God. I can't even imagine. My mind, I try to think about it today. I try to think about what it would be like with all the colors, with all the different people, and the beast, the 420 elders, and, and this multitudes of people, and Michael, and seeing Michael for the first time, the angel Michael and Gabriel. I mean, you think about this stuff, and then Gabriel is real. Michael is real. And one of these days, we're going to get to see them, and we're going to get to talk to them. Hey, Michael, what is going on, man? You have to hang out with Gabriel. What was it like telling Mary that she was going to bring forth the Savior of the world? And if we're going to get to know all of this stuff. We're going to get to hang out with some of these people. I mean, think about it. Heroes of faith. You talk about Peter and Elijah and Elisha and Abraham and Joseph and Moses. I mean, aren't there some people in the Bible you want to talk to? I got some, I got a whole lot of questions I want to ask some people. Amen. I want to get to the Bible by then. I'm already made. So hey, I'm going to just get there. I want to talk to these people. I want to hang out with them. I want to get to a place where there's we struggle, we struggle in this life where there's always pain, there's always heartache, there's always sorrow, there's always something going on. But thank God the Bible says that we are just pilgrims. We're just passing through. This world is not our home. Amen. We're just passing through. Amen. I don't want to, I don't want to plan on being here forever. I want the Lord to come back as the Bible says. Amen. Come quickly. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. The Revelation said, come quickly. Because I just want to go home. I just want to go home. Amen. When I'm gone from my house for so long, I just say, you know what, babe? I just want to go home. I just want to sleep in my bed. I want to sit on my couch. I want to go into my kitchen, open my refrigerator. I just want to go home. Amen. And I just want to go home. I want to go to heaven. Would you stand with me? I want you to realize that there is a prize. There is something worth fighting for. There is something worth praying for. And so when you get up and then God wakes you up in the middle of the night and he says, pray, don't turn them out because I'm telling you, if you do it, condition yourself. And then because one day he's going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ, he's going to say, thank you for listening to me and praying. Thank you for reading the Bible. Thank you for fasting. Thank you for, for being a witness. Thank you for worshiping. Thank you. For Christ. Thank you for using your talents for God. Thank you for not turning your back on me. Enter ye into my rest. Enter ye into the joy of thy Lord. Amen. He is so proud of heaven. He said, I've gone to prepare a place for you in the book of John. If it were not so, I would have told you. But in my Father's house, there are many mansions. Amen. And I just want to go and get me a mansion. And then would you lift your hands in this place? Amen. If somebody wants to come up and the keyboard for a moment, I want you to lift your hands in this place. I don't want anything to come between me and my relationship with God. And I want to keep my mind on the prize. I want to keep my eyes on the prize. I want to keep running this race 
He said, no, you know, they which run the race, run all, but only one receives a prize. Only the bride of Christ is going to receive the prize. Hey, man, I want to be a part of that bride. I want to get caught up together with them and meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. I want to know. We think we can feel the presence of God now. Just imagine, and then be literally inches away from Jesus Christ. Literally inches away from the one that spun heaven and earth into existence. The one that gave his life for you and me. And I know that we can feel him down here. But one of these days we're going to see him. One of these days we're going to experience the total fullness. I don't believe, I, I don't believe we need to come close to seeing the full fullness of God. Because if we did, I don't even know if we'd be able to survive the glory that comes with God. I don't think we'd be able to survive. Our human mind and the time, I don't think we could fathom. Our mind would be blown. And so I believe that God holds some things back, just like he did with Moses. No man can see God. So he put him in the cleft of the rod. He passed by him so he could see his hyper parts. But guess what? One of these days we're going to see him face to face. I'm going to look Jesus eyeball to eyeball. And then I can tell him on the camp face to face, thank you for your sacrifice. Thank you for loving me. I know the Bible says there's no weeping, but I can imagine just weeping for joy. Not because of sadness, but weeping because of joy. I can imagine that I'm a crier. So I can imagine just breaking down the work. I'm just saying thank you. Not because I'm sad, but just in gratitude, in awe of his glory. That's why the Bible says that we're going to be changed into an incorruptible seed. In a moment, the truth of the the last trouble, the Bible says, we shall be and we're going to get to experience the fullness of God. Gates of pearl, walls of jasper, streets of pure gold, so pure that you can see from them. Mansions, beautiful colors, the pure light of God shining everywhere. Oh, I love you, Jesus. He has prepared this awesome prize for us, an awesome habitation. And he wants you to be a part of it. And I want you to be a part of it. I want to be a part of it. Hallelujah. And then what you lift your hands in this place. I want to make heaven my home. If you would, would you just take a step out of your view? Would you come to an altar today? Would you come up front and just begin to thank God for the